you immediately. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm the, it's a very pleasant and wonderful thing to know that I was able to draw new people here who've never been to Bay High. That, that made my evening. I want you to know thank you. Or maybe you just got lost on the 101, <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> um, this, uh, this institution has been around for a long time. It's done a lot, a lot of history and a lot of gray matter has been smeared on the walls. I, I mean, like the internet was invented down the hall. I think the one bit was invented down there. <laughs> And this is, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of history, a lot of digital history here. And uh, yes, and it's true, I, as a, <clears throat> a kind of a, not a normal, having not followed a normal path as most scientists and academics have, have, I wouldn't say I wasn't welcome here. It, was, it wasn't, they didn't know how to fit me in. And Richard Anderson finally asked me to, to come and talk, and I forgot what our conversation was about. It was very self-indulgent. It was about death, huh? Well, in 15 minutes, I'll show you what the title was. <laughs> Just a second. Yeah, I'll show you what the title was. Here we go. Oh, hi. We got it, except I got to log into PERC. I'm in PERC. You, you sure it wasn't somebody else there? Ending the death mark. Oh, ending the death march. Yeah. Yes, we still haven't done that, have we? No. <laughs> ending the death march. Yeah. So um, I told Nancy I have this other talk that I was considering giving here. It's called The Suchness of Software. And it starts out by saying that, that we, the one thing that we do not know how to do in Silicon Valley is build software. <laughs> That's true, that's true. But Silicon Valley is not a place. It is a, uh, it is a state of mind. Although, uh, <laughs> although it actually is a place and it was really interesting for me to come back here. I've moved away seven years ago and, uh, and I drove down here and completely underestimated the time I would spend sitting in traffic. <laughs> you'd, you'd think I would know. I lived uh, for 28 years within a couple of miles of the Stanford campus on, for 24 of them on, that, on the wrong side of the tracks and for four of them up there with Hasso Plotner and, uh, and, and, the, and oh God, I hated that up there. So <laughs> we've witnessed this, this, this valley go from stone fruit valley to all that glitters must be gold valley with a brief timeout as Silicon Valley. That's where we are today. The, the furniture store down where I used to live is now selling Ferraris and Maseratis and Teslas. I used to hate going to LA because I thought they were so surface and worship money and that's because there was this big Ferrari Maserati dealer on the corner there. And now I find it's come here, so now I live in the country. That's how I start my talk. <clears throat> I, um, I neglected to say thank you, Nancy, for inviting me, and Edwin, thank you for hosting me, um, and to Xerox, of course, for your support. It's, um, it was very generous of you to invite me to harangue you guys. So. Um, so our story begins seven years ago. It's now seven and a half years ago. My wife and I sold our, our house up on the hill there next to Hasso. Actually, we weren't that close to Hasso because he, he lived on the one end of the ridge with all the high price houses. We lived on the other end of the ridge with the, we just barely make it up on the ridge. Um, and we moved to this uh, 50 acre ranch in the country. It's in West Petaluma and it's about an hour north of here. Well, during rush hour, it's about two hours north of here. And uh, <laughs> to my uh, surprise, I found an entirely new perspective uh, and, uh, on our high tech industry amongst the sheep and the chickens and the tall California grass. And that new perspective is the basis for this talk. And it's why pictures of Monkey Ranch are the background for my slides. 
So I'd like to start out this talk by asking you to do a little thought experiment with me. I'd like you to use your imagination, please. Imagine, for some of you this may not be too difficult to imagine, that you work at a giant social media company. Every day, you access massive collections of user data, analyzing it so you can give users exactly the posts they most want to see and not the posts that they don't. Your work is so good that you've created a, created a targeted advertising platform that's nearly perfect. Then one day you discover that Russian government hackers have used it to influence an American presidential campaign. Using the psychological profiles that you created, the Russians identified susceptible end users and flooded their feeds with hate messages, fear mongering, and outrageous lies about progressive candidates and organizations. And then you realize that your work directly contributed to the destruction of America's representative democracy. Thought I'd start on a high note. <laughs> or imagine you're a staff researcher at a major computer software company. You've been working on really cool learning algorithms for conversational user interfaces, and you've created a chatbot to show off what your AI is capable of. Your boss is so impressed with your work that he lets you deploy the chatbot on the web. But hackers discover your chatbot and begin filling it with lies and prejudices and telling it terrible things. Within one day, using the software that you wrote, all your chatbot can do is spout racist, misogynistic, and hateful venom. And your boss has to disable it immediately. This, of course, happened, you know. Then you realize that your work can easily be turned into something very destructive. Or imagine that you became an intellectual property lawyer because you want creative inventors to be inspired and supported. You worked for years to empower innovators to protect their ideas. Then one day, you discover that the overwhelming majority of patent lawsuits are pursued by patent trolls, those who patent ideas but never actually make anything. They just wait for someone else to create a product, and then they sue them for undeserved royalties. That's when you realize that your life's work has empowered a few greedy people to engage in legalized extortion. Or, how long can he go on like this? <laughs> Imagine that you are an expert in linguistics and you've spent years working on new spell check algorithms. Your work involves machine learning, artificial intelligence, and very clever indexing methods. It's deployed globally on Apple computers. Then one day it's discovered that it autocorrects some prescription drug names into completely different drugs. When duloxetine becomes fluoxetine, there's a high likelihood that even though no one notices, someone is going to suffer from taking the wrong medication. Then you realize that your innovations have brought harm to innocent people. Why is this happening? Is it inevitable that our coolest technological achievements become agents of evil? Well, no, I don't believe that it is inevitable. And today I'm going to talk about practical methods to avoid creating high-tech products that enable toxic behavior. But it's clear that our current methods aren't there yet. The technology we build has certainly made people's lives easier and better, but unintended side effects happen more and more often and tear at the fabric of our society. We are good people, and we do our jobs with the best of intentions, but we find to our dismay that we have enabled bad behavior and bad outcomes. So where did this evil stuff come from? 
Are we evil? I'm perfectly willing to stipulate that you aren't evil, except for you. But neither is your boss evil, nor is Larry Page or Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. And yet, the results of our work, our best, most altruistic work, often turns evil when it's deployed in the larger world. We go to work every day, genuinely expecting to make the world a better place with powerful technology, but somehow evil is sneaking in despite our good intentions. It's like the way Dr. Frankenstein didn't understand the monster he created. There's a mechanism at work here that we don't fully understand. We need to deconstruct this phenomenon so that we can recognize it and prevent it from happening again. In the 1940s, Robert J. Oppenheimer headed up the Manhattan Project, the largest scientific effort the world had ever seen. His job was to invent the atomic bomb so the United States could use it to end World War II. But when Oppenheimer saw the first atomic explosion, he realized he had created something terrible. This was Oppenheimer's moment. Not only was he a god of physics and science, but now he was Mars, he was Ares. He had become a god of war, bringing chaos, suffering, and death. Today, we, the tech practitioners, those who design, develop, and deploy technology, are having our own Oppenheimer moments. It's that moment when you realize that your best intentions were subverted when your product was used in unexpected and unwanted ways. It's that moment when you realize that even though you aren't racist, your algorithms might be. It's that moment when you realize that your software, designed to bring people together, instead is driving them apart into tribal isolation. It's that moment when you realize that the social and economic checks and balances that prevent excess and abuse don't apply anymore. Like Dr. Oppenheimer, like Dr. Frankenstein, you realize that nothing can harness your creation and it's beginning to run amok. My first thoughts are, who can we blame? <laughs> I assume those are your first thoughts. <clears throat> we can't blame the technology because it does amazing good things for us as well as bad. It's easy to blame the founders, your coworkers, the venture capitalists, your annoying boss, but they're just as troubled by this as we are. Tony Fidel, the founder of Nest, wants a Hippocratic Oath for designers, where they pledge to work ethically and do no harm. Sam Altman, the president of Y Combinator, is writing an ethics constitution, and Bill Gates is giving billions to charity. Our narrative-seeking, storytelling brains want a villain. But this isn't a Disney movie, and Cruella de Vil isn't coming for our puppies. Really, there's no one here to blame. It's a systems problem. It's as though the titanic ship of technology is sinking, but we never hit an iceberg. We're filling with water, but nobody can find the leak. We keep searching for the giant rip in the hull caused by the evil iceberg or the evil captain or the evil shipbuilders, but we find no evil and we find no giant hull. Yet the water keeps getting deeper. Trying to find a single point of failure or origin of malice only works on simple systems. But all of the tech products we build are complex systems and their networked environment is yet another level of complex system. The water, the evil, isn't coming from one big hole, but from a constellation of tiny ones, like a hundred million microscopic laser drilled holes in the hull of the Titanic. They collectively add up to a fatally huge gash. And that's just what a systems problem looks like. Systems problems are by nature distributed ones, and their solutions are distributed too. 
we put those millions of tiny leaks into the system. There was no malice, no evil. That's why we have to apply our efforts to preventing tiny leaks, rather than trying to predict and then stop a single catastrophic event. The technology we use changes so fast, it renders our good intentions irrelevant and inadequate. No matter how well-intentioned, our good work permutes into bad. Our innocence simply isn't sufficient, and we have to master this system. We need to identify the weaknesses in our products and business models when they are tiny, embryonic things. We have to get ahead of this phenomenon because once it emerges, it's too late. And we need to do it in a way that transcends the technology so it applies to everything, so it's long-term, so that it is sustainable. The blogosphere is awash in long-form commentary asking how we can bring ethics back to technology. People tell us to be good, but they don't tell us how. Now, there's a lot of work to do, but first we need to have a clear goal. The founders of Facebook and Google and a thousand other companies, large and small, have as their primary goal to make money. Their second avowed goal is to not be evil, to do no harm. And there is abundant proof that this does not work. When your primary goal is to make money, all other goals devolve into mere words. Don't be evil is too vague, too simplistic, and too hard to relate to the daily work of tech. Besides, it's always in second place, and it always loses to the imperatives of making money. We need a new goal, a new rubric for success, one that makes us better citizens first without stopping us from making money second. So here's my proposal. I want to be a good ancestor. My goal is to create a better world for our children and their children, yours and mine. Every day I ask myself, does what I'm doing make the world a better place than when I found it? When you think like a good ancestor, you're forced to think about the whole system. You can no longer maximize isolated measurements at the expense of others. You can no longer excuse bad behavior in the interest of profit. Conservative political dogma says that you can either make money or you can be a good citizen, but not both. This is a lie. You don't have to behave badly to make money. Virgin, Costco, and Patagonia are all proof that you can be a very profitable good ancestor. As I have the obligatory Steve Jobs quote. As Steve Jobs said, profit is a byproduct of quality. People are very loyal to good quality and not at all loyal to products that behave badly. They may use them, but they're not loyal. So while there is value in making money, I value even more making the world a better place for our children. By making good ancestry our primary goal, we can work to prevent our products from turning to the dark side and we can still build profitable businesses. Every day, instead of saying, do no evil, ask, how can I be a good ancestor? Being a good ancestor is my goal, and I want you to make it your goal, too. OK, while the first step is having a clear goal, there's many subsequent steps needed to solve this challenge. It's all giving me a strong sense of deja vu, that sensation where you feel like you've been there before. 25 years ago, as personal computing was exploding on the world, it had become clear that technology was hard to use. Everyone knew that we needed to make software user-friendly, but no one knew exactly how to do that. Back then, plenty of smart people thought it couldn't even be done. Someone had to define user-friendly in measurable ways, then develop a taxonomy for the field, invent a set of tools, 
create a process framework, establish clear examples demonstrating the benefits, train a cadre of skilled practitioners, and then take that show on the road and proselytize it. That's what I did for interaction design during the 90s and the aughts. Our presence here today proves how design has become an important role. It's well known, it's trusted, and it's omnipresent. Now it's time to do the same thing for being a good ancestor. Renato Verdugo is my brilliant young Chilean collaborator. We are developing a framework and tools that we call ancestry thinking. Because that's cool to have a kind of thinking, you know. And we're nothing if not cool. <clears throat> the first step is awareness of the problem. It's vital that practitioners pay attention to how their products are applied in the real world by actual users. The second step is creating a language, a taxonomy that lets us see where and how those millions of tiny holes get drilled into the hull of our technology. So far, we've identified three main vectors by which bad behavior creeps into your product. They are assumptions, externalities, and time scale. And we examine these vectors by asking ourselves three hard questions. First, we ask, what assumptions are we making? Whenever we design a solution to a problem, we base our thinking on certain assumptions. If we don't rigorously examine all of those assumptions, our intentions can become lost, and we open the door to bad ancestry. Someone was making assumptions when they created their disaster relief website requiring users to have electrical power and Wi-Fi. Scarce things in a disaster. You've probably all seen this. Um, someone assumed that the white engineering staff was representative of the people who would use their new sensor-equipped bathroom soap dispenser. And it works fine if your skin is white, but it fails to detect black skin. A good assumption can turn bad over time or in different circumstances. So you have to identify, inventory, and regularly re-examine every assumption you make. The fossil fuel industry used to provide a lot of jobs and economic opportunity in the USA. Not anymore. Solar is where the jobs are, where the growth is, where the opportunities lay. And it's a proving ground for tomorrow's leaders. Unexamined assumptions become dogma. And dogma is the opposite of intentionality. So to be a good ancestor, we can't let anything hide. We must be explicit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Secondly, we have to ask, what externalities are we creating? Externalities are those things that affect us or that we affect, that are, rushed, that are pushed out of our attention, whether by choice, neglect, or ignorance. Everything we do is part of a complex web, and nothing is completely external. Every Monday, a big green truck comes to take my trash away. But there really is no away. It takes my trash down to the landfill by the river. My children are going to have to deal with that landfill. Whenever you say, that's not my problem, you create an externality. And every externality is a hole in your boat. It's another way bad ancestry creeps into your world. For example, there's a rideshare company that provides a great car hire experience for riders, but it regards the driver's welfare as someone else's problem. Drivers are forced into a, a precarious hand-to-mouth existence, degrading our civilization for everyone. Or how about the giant retailer that prides itself on offering the lowest prices to its shoppers, but it doesn't pay its employees a living wage? The employees are forced to rely on second jobs and food stamps. Machine learning algorithms, sometimes called AI, create significant externalities. Just letting the black box make decisions is an externality. Then, when we trust those decisions without having methods 
for oversight or validation, we create more externalities. Compounding the problem, most people are happy to abdicate their responsibilities to the algorithm. It seems easier, and it is, because it's an externalization. For example, a company that makes software to automate hiring proudly uses machine learning to streamline the process. Its black box algorithms recommend candidates based on those you've hired in the past. The problem is that any racial, age, or gender prejudices are invisibly sustained, and nobody questions it. Nobody even sees it. Externalities hide in our point of view, our ignorance, and our social norms, and the systems we create and use. In reality, everything is connected. There's no such thing as an externality. If you regard something as external, you are just bequeathing trouble to your descendants. You're slamming a door on a fire, but it's still burning in there, and you're leaving it for your children to put out. Thirdly, we ask, what time scale are we using? What's the lifespan of our actions, our products, and their effects? Our tools for peering ahead are weak, so we design based on the way things are right now, even though our products will live on in the uncertain future. Well, I'm a perfect example of this. Software that I wrote back in the 1970s conserved precious memory by using only two numbers for the year. And believe me, that was a good trade-off back then. The turn of the millennium, the year 2000, seemed very far away, so I helped create the Y2K bug. <clears throat> All of our, you guys remember the Y2K bug? Yeah, it's good, you kids know. <laughs> everything went dark across the planet. All of our social systems bias us towards a presentist focus, capitalist markets, rapid technological advance, professional reward systems, and industrial management. You have to ask yourself, how will this be used in 10 years, in 30? When will it die? What will happen to its users? To be a good ancestor, we have to look at the entire lifespan of our work. So, I know I said that there were three considerations, but there's a strong fourth one also. And having established the three conduits for bad ancestry, assumptions, externalities, and time scale, we now need some tactical tools for ancestry thinking. Because it's a systems problem, individual people are rarely to blame. But people become representatives of the system. That is, the face of bad ancestry will be a person. So it takes some finesse to move in a positive direction without polarizing the situation. You can see from the United States' current political situation how easy it is to slip into polarization. The nice person behind the desk didn't create the department's policies. Your crazy uncle didn't write his political party's platform. It's not your fault that your company uses some heinous algorithms. You don't have to feel guilty about what your company is doing. And I don't expect you to confront your boss or your coworkers. But I do expect you to work diligently to raise everyone's awareness of the problem. And it is a never-ending job. Systems need constant work. John Gall's theory of general systemantics says that system failure is an intrinsic feature of systems. In other words, all systems go haywire and will continue to go haywire, and only constant vigilance can keep these systems working in a positive direction. You cannot ignore systems. You have to ask questions about systems. You must probe constantly and deeply and not accept rote answers. And when you detect bad assumptions, ignored side effects, or distortions of time, you have to ask these same questions of the others around you. 
You need to lead them through your thought process so that they see the problem too. This is how you reveal the secret language of the system. You ask about the external forces at work on the system. Who is outside of the system? What do they think of it? What leverage do they have? How might they use the system? Who is excluded from it? Ask about the impact of the system. Who is affected by it? What other systems are affected? What are the indirect long-term effects? And who gets left behind? Ask about the consent your system requires. Who agrees with what you are doing? Who disagrees? Who silently condones it? And who is ignorant of it? Ask who benefits from the system? Who makes money from it? Who loses money? Who gets promoted? And how does it affect the larger economy? Ask about how the system can be misused. How can it be used to cheat? to steal, to confuse, to polarize, to alienate, to dominate, to terrify. Who might want to misuse it? What could they gain by it? And who could lose? If you aren't asking questions like these regularly, you're probably making a leaky boat. Lately, I've been talking a lot about what I call working backwards. It's my preferred method of problem solving. In the conventional world, gnarly challenges are always presented from within a context, a framework of thinking about the problem. The given framework is almost always too small of a window. Sometimes it's the wrong window altogether. Viewed this way, your problems can seem inscrutable and unsolvable, a Gordian knot. Working backwards can be very effective in this situation. It's similar to Edward de Bono's notion of lateral thinking and Taichi Ono's idea of the five whys. Instead of addressing the problem and its familiar surroundings, you step backwards and you examine the surroundings instead. You deconstruct and understand the problem definition is, if you deconstruct and understand the problem definition first, it's more productive than directly addressing the solution. Typically, you discover that the range of possible solutions first presented are too limiting. They're too conventional, and they suppress innovation. When the situation forces you to choose between option A or option B, the choice is almost always option C. If we don't work backwards, we tend to treat symptoms rather than causes. For example, we clamor for a cure for cancer, but we ignore the search for what causes cancer. We institute recycling programs, but we don't reduce our, cons our consumption of disposable plastic. We eat organic grains and meat, but we still grow them using profoundly unsustainable agricultural practices. The difficulty presented by working backwards is that it typically violates established boundaries. The encompassing framework is often in a different field of thought and authority. Most people, when they detect such a boundary, refuse to cross it. They say, that's not my responsibility. Ah, but this is exactly what an externality looks like. And boundaries are even more counterproductive in tech. A few years ago, a famous graphic by Tom Goodwin circulated on the web that said, in 2015, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. The problem is that taxi companies are regulated by taxing and controlling vehicles. Media is controlled by regulating content. Retailing is controlled by taxing inventory and accommodations by taxing rooms. All the governmental checks and balances are sidestepped by business model innovation. These new business models are better than the old ones. 
But the new ideas short circuit the controls we need to keep them from behaving like bad citizens, like bad ancestors. Innovation introduces never before seen negatives. We cannot protect ourselves against new negatives by legislating old symptoms and artifacts. Instead of legislating mechanisms, we have to legislate desired outcomes. The mechanisms may change frequently, but the outcomes remain very constant. We need to step backwards to be good ancestors. And when we step backwards, we see the big picture. But seeing it shows us that there's a lot of deplorable stuff going on in the world today. And a lot of it is enabled and exacerbated by the high-tech products that we make. It might not be our fault, but it's our responsibility to fix it. One reaction to looking at the big picture is despair when you realize that the whole machine is going in the wrong direction, it's easy to be overwhelmed with a fatalistic sense of doom. Another reaction to seeing this elephant is denial. It makes you want to just put your head back down and concentrate on those wireframes. But those paths are the option A and option B of the problem. And I'm committed to option C. I want to fix the problem. If you find yourself at the point in a product's development where clearly unethical requests are made of you, your boss asks you to lie, cheat, or steal, then you're too late for anything other than brinksmanship. I applaud you for your courage if you're willing to put your job on the line for this, but it's unfair for me to ask you to do it. My goal here is to arm you with practical, useful tools that will effectively turn the tech industry toward becoming a good ancestor. This is not a rebellion. These tools will be more of a dialectic than a street protest. We can only play the long game here. Our very powerlessness as individual practitioners makes us think that we can't change the system. Unless, of course, we are one of the few empowered people. We imagine that powerful people take powerful actions. We picture the lone Tiananmen protester standing resolutely in front of a column of battle tanks and thus making us good ancestors. Similarly, we picture the CEO, Jack Dorsey, banning Nazis from Twitter and thus, in a stroke, making everything better. This is a nice fantasy, but it's not actually true. The tanks in China had already been given the order to stop, otherwise they would have driven right over the tank man. And Jack Dorsey is stuck in a dilemma he wishes desperately to get out of. If he bans Nazis, he asserts that censoring hate speech is Twitter's responsibility. And if he doesn't ban Nazis, he asserts that everyone will play nicely together. Because as soon as he bans a single Nazi, he opens himself up to a tsunami of criticism, and worse. There will be a wave of lawsuits from those who think he's chosen too many Nazis and those who think he's chosen too few. The fact that his refusal to ban a Nazi is in itself a choice and opens him up to an equally large wave of criticism is why you don't want to be in his shoes. Dorsey is at the end of a whip, jerking back and forth. There's no good decision for him to make. He's looking down the barrel of option A and option B. So he does what's easiest, nothing. But you and I know that you have to do something. And the only correct op option is option C. Make no mistake about it, while Dorsey faces the twin evils of choices A and B, he isn't an evil person, I hope. And he is not guilty of any crime other than not thinking things through. And ultimately, that's the solution, taking the time to think things through. The more practitioners who do this, and the earlier in the creation process we do it, the more effective it becomes. Because there is no evil agenda, there's no anti-evil agenda either. 
This is all about our collective oversight and gentle intervention early in the process. When we stand in the center of North America, watching the mile-wide Mississippi River flow by, our powerlessness to affect the mighty waterway is tangible. But if we ascend to the continental divide at the crest of the Rocky Mountains, where the river rises, it's just a tiny rivulet, and we can divert the course of the Mississippi with a shovel. This is the nature of how we divert the course of the tech industry. Neither Jack nor any of us is going to fix Twitter's misbehavior with a single dramatic action. Twitter went off the rails one millimeter at a time, and the only way to put it back is with, is with an equal number of tiny corrections. The way to vanquish evil is to find it at the source, in the headwaters, when it is a tiny and vulnerable thing. I don't mean to pick on Twitter or Jack Dorsey, but they're just a perfect example of the challenge we face. Monitoring and curating an open public forum is hard, expensive work. Dorsey was an idealistic Silicon Valley entrepreneur, believing that he could create a fully automated platform that would police itself. For that to work, he had to ignore the real world behavior of anonymous strangers. He assumed that respectful public discourse would be self-perpetuating. He externalized responsibility for policing his forum, and he only thought about how things were right now. Like most libertarians, he failed to recognize how hard it is to be effortless, how much work goes into making sure that nasty people don't shout down nice people, because nice people never shout down nasty people. He's been in denial about that behavior since day one. And despite Jack Dorsey's role as CEO of Twitter, he lacks the power to fix it. He's as unable to change the course of a mighty river as anyone else inside his company. He has power, but he lacks agency. Remarkably, the most junior practitioner at Twitter, while having none of Dorsey's power, has the exact same amount of agency. True, neither of them have much, but it's not zero. Power is the ability to change macro structures. Agency works on the micro level. Agency is local. Power is global. Power is being able to end homophobia. Agency is one person coming out of the closet. Power is banning Nazis from Twitter. Agency is one person pointing out that there's no mechanism to, on Twitter to identify suspected Nazis and that there should be one. Agency, in its embryonic state, manifests simply as talking. We ask questions. We seek explanations. We point out the considerations. But the more you talk, the more you get heard, and the more you get heard, the more influence you have. Agency grows the more you exercise it. You start by paying attention. This evolves into asking questions, which grows into discussions, followed by learning, then cooperation, then teamwork, and ultimately action. When you start a dialogue with people, you can make them think. You can show them a different point of view. Agency is a mirror you can hold up to your colleagues. It's an amplifier, a news feed, a loudspeaker, a book, a friend. And you create a relationship, and you become more human in their mind. Now, admittedly, this is a gradual process, an incremental process, but it's the only viable process. And it works in and for the long term. So in 2016, I spoke with activist blogger Anil Dash about the state of the tech industry. And he posed a rhetorical question. Why aren't we teaching ethics in engineering schools? His challenge really got under my skin, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. But ethics, ooh. There's nothing more boring, useless, old, and pedantic. It's hard to imagine a subject less interesting, especially for engineers, than technology and the E-word. 
Fortuitously, I had recently been talking with folks at the engineering school at the University of California at Berkeley about teaching something there. Renato Verdugo, my new friend and collaborator with the cool hair, agreed to help. And, um, and we just completed, <laughs> he has great hair. He has, hair. he has great hair, yeah, Renato. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, you're starting a conversation, yes. So my new friend and collaborator, Renato, agreed to help. And we just completed co-teaching a semester-long class called Thinking Like a Good Ancestor at the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation on the Berkeley campus. Now, Renato works for Google, and they generously supported our work. We're introducing our students to the fundamentals of how technology can lose its way, of awareness and intentionality. We're giving the students our taxonomy of assumptions, externalities, and time. Instead of focusing on how tech behaves badly, we're focusing on how good tech is allowed to become bad. We're not trying to patch the holes in the Titanic, but prevent them from occurring in future tech. So we're encouraging our students to exercise their personal agency. And we expect these brilliant young students at Berkeley to take ancestry thinking out into the world. And we expect them to make it a better place for all of our children. We're going to be teaching it again starting next month. Like those students, we are the practitioners. We are the makers. We are the ones who design, develop, and deploy software-powered experiences. At the start of this talk, I ask you to imagine yourself as a tech practitioner, witnessing your creations turned against our common good. Now I want you to imagine yourself creating products that can't be turned toward evil, products that won't spy on you, and won't addict you, and won't discriminate against you. More than anyone else, you have the power to create this reality because you have your hands on the technology. And I believe that the future is in the hands of the hands-on. Ultimately, we, the craftspeople who make the artifacts of the future, have more effect on the world than the business executives, the politicians, and the investment community. We are like the keystone in the arch and without us, it all falls to the ground. While it may not be our fault that our products let evil leak in, it's certainly within our power to prevent it. The welfare of our children and their children is at stake, and taking care of our offspring is the best way to take care of ourselves. We need to stand up and stand together, not in opposition, but as a light shining in a dark room. Because if we don't, we stand to lose everything. We need to harness our technology for good and prevent it from devouring us. I want you to understand the risks and know the inflection points. I want you to use your agency to sustain a dialogue with your colleagues, to work collectively and relentlessly. I want you to become an ancestry thinker. I want you to create products you can be proud of, products that make the world a better place instead of just making yet another billionaire. I want you to change the vision of success in tech from making money to making a just and equitable world for everyone. You have the power to do this with your leadership, your agency, and with your hands on. And you can be a good ancestor. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're ready for questions from the audience. Al. Thank you so much. Ancestry thinking didn't work for religion over the centuries. I was wondering what makes you think that it's going to work for technology? Um, so, uh, Thank you, that's a good question. 
Uh, a few months ago, I, I read uh, Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens. I don't know if you've read that. It's really, it's fascinating because um, uh, there's, there's, I mean, he talks about the ascent of man and he talks about the various social structures that we build. And um, <clears throat> he, I mean, he, he talks about, you know, the, one of the great social mechanisms for, for, you know, pulling humanity out of, out of the dark ages was, was religion. And, um, and one of the worst blights on humanity is religion, you know? And he talks about one of the, the, the great mechanisms that has pulled humankind into, a, into a, an enlightened future, you know, is, is, is uh, industry. And it, of course, is a, a terrible thing. And the same thing for capitalism, how what, a, what, it is, what an awesome engine of advance it is and what an awesome engine of destruction it is. And you know that old saying, wherever you go, there you are? <laughs> I mean, with a common denominator here, it's not you know, religion or ideology or anything. It's, it's us. It's, it's who we are. I mean, he also talks about how uh, y you know, the most top predators, you know, like lions and wolves, have, have evolved into that role over millennia. And, and when they get there, they're comfortable in that position. But then he talks about humankind who has evolved over the millennia to be a, a middling um, hunter-gatherer who squatted in the dirt and ate berries. And, um, and then in a blink of an, of an evolutionary eye, we became the top, 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 top predator. And we're very uncomfortable in that role <laughs> because we still expect something to, to steal our meat from us. So <laughs> I thought that was a brilliant insight. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I think that ancestry thinking is the answer to all of humankind's problems. No, I don't. I, I think that what I'm saying is that is that each step forward is, is also a step backwards. That's who we are. We are scared of each other. We are insecure. We are human beings. And it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a thousand civilizations rise and fall between, between now and when we've evolved out of that insecurity. So. So, you know, you know, America, you know, got seriously violent against Nazis in my father's time. And, you know, we might have to do it again in my son's time. And, and that's a very sad thing. That's welcome to the human race. So that's my answer. That's a tough question. Is I, I, the, I mean, this is the thing that, that Steven Pinker talks about, is that, is that a very controversial person, and I'm, I'm sorry I brought him up even. But, <laughs> but he talks about the long ascent of man, of human. Sorry, I'm learning. Um, and, um, and, it, and it's possible to show that we, in fact, are moving forward. And so I believe we will continue to move forward. And I believe that we will do horrific, terrible things on the way, and probably in the name of ancestry thinking. Another question. Um, I'd like to suggest that personas might be a key tool to practice ancestry thinking. <laughs> so here's, <the laughs> here's my th a train of thought on that. I'd like to ask a question about it. <laughs> um, if we think about what it means to create this just and equitable world, one way to think about that is balancing the power dynamic between those people who have power and those who have less power. And so it, as we're designing technology, we could imagine what does it mean to design Twitter to make it 
more difficult to use if you're a Nazi, to make it more easy to use if you're a social activist. Um, I mean, if we're doing, I work at a more boring t company, uh, you know, if we're working, uh, and, and talking to some people here, you know, if you're working on tax software, let's say, how do you make it really um, optimized for somebody who's low income uh, instead of somebody who's optimizing their capital gains taxes? So I think that often if we think from a social perspective, we end up segmenting our user base into these, into these other types of personas. Um, but I, I think that the challenge for that, if we were actually to design for those people, is that we would never, Twitter would never put Nazis as one of their key personas. <coughs> um, they might not even put a social activist as a key persona. But if we actually want to design for people with these social needs, how might we be able to use that sort of thinking to raise awareness about these user segments that are disempowered and not getting enough attention? This is, this, this, thank you, this is a good question. Uh, it, it is, it's a tough question. The, this, is not a, um, this is not an interaction design problem. Okay. Um, what's that? <laughs> it's, it's, um, look. I'm a maker. I've always been a maker. That's what I do. I think like a maker. I mean, I, I, uh, I don't even think like an engineer. I think like I just like to make things, you know? And, and software is one of those intriguing and delightful things that I made things out of for a long time. You know, now I putter in my shop and I make things out of wood and metal. But it's, it's, that's not the medium in which we are working. Okay, so some of the finest design work that I've seen is um, I mean it's weaponry and, and the engineer in me is fascinated by weaponry too you know so it's it, it's like you you have to not look at this as a design problem because it's, I mean, it's a, it is a, at a meta level. This is a social problem. So the thing is, is that, is that what's going on is that, is, is that, is that the, we, I'm assuming that all of you in here are, share my interest in making, okay? You're, I'm, I've accused you of being practitioners, uh, you know, Maybe, maybe I'm wrong and you're not, but you're all wearing t-shirts and, <laughs> and you look like you're too smart for your own good. So you probably like to make things and you like to make good things, you know? But the thing is, is that, is that we then allow ourselves to be aimed like weapons by people who are not interested in making things and they're not interested in being good. This, th when I came to Silicon Valley in, I mean, I started my first software company in 1976 in Oakland. And a couple years later, I was in Menlo Park. And, uh, and the dominant notion in my head in the mid-70s was, oh, look at this cool stuff I can make. I mean, it was just so exciting. I can make great stuff, and I've got the freedom to build, and, and I can make money at it, too. I can make good money, a lot of money, but I can make great stuff, okay? But making money was the side effect. Now what happens is people come to this valley because they want to make a lot of money. And if, as a side effect, they make a cool thing, that would be nice. That's a side, a byproduct. Okay, 
And what I'm saying is that if the people who think that way get too powerful, then we're all going to lose. So this is not a design problem. This is a power struggle. This is a life or death battle. Okay? I mean, so, you know, the greatest sports car is the Porsche, right? And you know that Dr. Ferdinand Porsche, you know, this brilliant German inventor, you know, got his start designing turret slewing mechanisms for tiger tanks. You see, what, I mean, that's what designers do, is they design, they work on cool problems. You know, air-cooled sports cars, tank turrets. What we need to do is we need to not let ourselves be used to build tank turrets. Okay? And again, I don't expect any one of you guys to stand up and throw your wooden shoes into the works. But I expect you to be asking a thousand little questions, saying, well, what about this? Well, are, are we, do we really want to go in this direction? Have we considered this? And asking your, your fellow workers. And just think how wonderful it would be if all of the tech workers in Silicon Valley said to all of the money people, no, we're not going to do that. I mean, it takes a long time to build that kind of um, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's a these are all great words. Cohesion, moxie, consensus, teamwork, fellowship, comradeship. You know, but these are all old cliches, and all of them have been subverted in history. And they're going to get subverted again. But what are you going to do? Yeah, iterate. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's, that's, we are so boned. <laughs> but the thing is, is that, is that you know, you, 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 you got to go down fighting. You know, one, one path is a certainty of getting boned, and the other path is a possibility of getting boned. Okay, so all I offer you is, you know, blood, sweat, tears, and toil, you know. I, and that, you know, because that's what this is. This is, a, this is a battle for the survival of Great Britain. Is there a, another question? Let's have a happy, upbeat <laughs> question. <laughs> oh, okay, now that the pressure's on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I started out my career as a maker and had too much trouble with all the things you just talked about industrial designer, so even more maker, maker, um, and decided to go back to school recently. Ooh. Okay, um, decided to go back to school recently for applied anthropology. Um, so wanting to study now <coughs> the sorts of cultures that beget problematic designs that create unsustainable futures, environmentally, socially, the whole shebang. So now that I'm trying to re-enter the non-academic world, I'm wondering if there's a, a, a space for a person that, that, that wants to, to be critical, as a, a, not, not just incidentally, but a, as a, as a full-time job that wants to kind of poke and prod and to think about all the things that you just mentioned. Uh, you know, want to work on better problems, but wondering, um, if you see the pull, so you, you've kind of talked about us as, as, as you know, pushing ourselves as, as being better human beings and better innovators, um, but it, do you see the pull from the industry side, from people who are in positions to, to bring that mindset into the industry, um, or, or do you have any ideas how to build that capacity, or is that just completely incompatible with how businesses are structured? Thank you. Um, so, so um, 
I think our industry is is very much a a uh, a microcosm of politics in America, where there's there's like if you if you ask any individual in America if they want to have health care, the answer is yes. And if they want to have good transportation, the answer is yes. And if they want to have bridges that are maintained, the answer is yes. And if they want to have a good retirement, the answer is yes. All, you know, the liberal agenda is what the, everybody wants. But then if you say, do you want the liberal agenda? They say, no, we don't want that shit. That's gonna, who's going to pay for that, you know, and all that stuff. And so, so there, there's the, the same kind of, it's, There's the, the, the stories we use are inadequate for ourselves. This is George Lakoff's um, uh, premise that we, we, we conceive of the world, I mean from birth, we conceive of the world by building primal metaphors in our mind and then we build metaphors out of metaphors out of metaphors and, and that's how we conceive of what's going on in the world and, um, and we slot things into those metaphors. And, and the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Reagan-esque philosophy of, of, of you know, the, the, pro the government isn't the solution, they're the problem. You know, has turned out to be to resonate with more metaphors in people's heads and more people's heads than anything else, and so at the at that political level, people vote against their own best self-interest. Okay, well, I believe the exact same thing in microcosm is happening in the high-tech industry, which is that that I mean, if any of you have been paying attention to me on Twitter, I've been having this giant, ongoing, never-ending, pissing contest about ROI. And, and it's like ROI is not a thing that exists. It's a it's a it's a figment. It's it's like it's like saying the government is the problem. It's like saying you need to have an ROI for what you're doing, and you need to present it to me. I'm your manager. It's just ridiculous. It's a ridiculous way of thinking and of prioritizing things. And and what we do is in capital expenditure anyway. It's not an investment. So how could there be a return on it? How could you track that return? It, none of it makes any sense. And yet it has that, that ring of, of that sounds business-like. Everybody's telling me in the design community, oh, I have to think like a business person. So they, you know, I got to figure out ROI. So here's what I'm, I, boy, I'm taking a long roundabout way to do this, um, is that there, I would say that 90% that of the people in Silicon Valley don't give a shit about money, okay? And yet we are all just insecure enough. We just recognize the problem and how it could be us in that living in that cardboard box down by the river that we're all focused on money, okay? And this serves the ends of the 10% of the people who are here just to make money. Okay? So, now again, I'm not asking you to shoot yourself in the foot. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, we need to stop talking about money like it means a good goddamn. Because it doesn't. There's enough wealth in our world. We're lucky here in the United States. I mean, there are places, you know, where there isn't enough wealth in the land to live. But there's enough wealth here in the land to live. We can do just fine, okay? And what we're doing is we're rapidly squandering that. And what we need to do is we need to slam on the brakes and we need to say, why am I working so hard for money that's just gonna go to somebody else and none of it to me? Now, hey, mea culpa. I spent, you know, 30 years, you know, laboring in the, in the money mines in Silicon Valley. So, and you can accuse me of, you know, being one of these guys who gets in his, his 60s and goes, oh shit, I have to buy my way into heaven, you know, I have to. 
and I'll, 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 I'll cop to that. But, um, <laughs> but it's really interesting. You know, I, I, um, when I moved to the country, I, I learned that every single thing that I know about agriculture is wrong. Every single thing. Okay? So everything you've been told about food and growing food and farmers and agriculture and water and crops and pesticides and fertilizers, it's all bullshit. It's all wrong. I mean, there's kernels of truth in all that stuff, but it's all wrong. And so if you go, oh, well, wait a minute, what are the relationships? And you go back and you say, maybe we could, we could reassemble the pieces of the puzzle and there'd be a good food for everybody and it wouldn't be a problem. And then you kind of go, well, could we do the same thing with housing? And then you go, well, could we do the same thing with work? And, and the answer is, yeah, we could. Except it's not in the best interest of a few people for us to not work so hard and to not be so desperate about our futures and to not be so desperate about, about, about food and where we live. And now, again, you can't do anything drastic here, otherwise you will end up starving in the cardboard box down by the river, and I don't want that for any of you. So that, that person left. <laughs> but, um, the, um, who was it who said, um, Oh, Scott Galloway, Professor Galloway, brilliant guy, read his book, The Four, says, um, says there's no better time than today to become a billionaire. There's no worse time than today to become a millionaire. You see, the social mobility that existed in my parents' day, and even in, in my day, is it's gone. You know, so that that the the tease of climbing the ladder doesn't exist. We live in a freaking bubble. Okay, I live in Petaluma. I live in West Petaluma, and guys have pickup trucks and they actually haul shit with them. Okay, they're not <laughs> statements. <laughs> These guys, <laughs> they may have a hat, but they also have cattle. And, and I'm telling you that Silicon Valley, and, and I'm in the penumbra of the wealth that emanates from this region, but every single thing that you see out there on El Camino Real is not real. It is not representative of the world out there. And, and, um, and so we're doing just fine, you know. We're all doing great. You guys, all you, half of you drive Teslas, and the other half drive BMWs, and, you know, you have nice places to live. It's not normal. <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't want to take those things away from you guys, you know. I, I, I like that stuff too. But, um, but, it's, but it's really easy to look around and say, you know, this, this, this treadmill I'm on is, is okay. Because it, it's not. It's not okay. And um, where were we going with this? <laughs> Jesus. Somebody once said, you ask Alan for a horse, he gives you a camel and then whacks the humps off. <laughs> <laughs> Is, we got another question here. I have a, a very s simple question. I'm curious, you did say that this was a, a warm up for giving this talk to a, to a larger audience or to a paying audience. And uh, I'm curious who that audience is. I mean, who is the intended audience after tonight and beyond us to, to hear um, what you have to say? Um, well, I'm gonna be, a, I, I wanna give this talk to as many places as I possibly can. I'll be delivering it at uh, UX Australia in Melbourne in three weeks. And I have delivered it once before as the opening keynote at the IXDA conference in Lyon, France, about in February. Yeah, and um, and they liked it better than you guys did. 
<laughs> they were French. They had no idea what I was saying. <laughs> That's why. But I just looked good. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I've got a couple of questions for you. I'm a PhD student at Penn State, and I'm wondering if you might know my advisor, Jack Carroll. Who? Yeah. Jack Carroll. Jack? Jack Carroll? Jack, John Carroll? John M. Carroll? Community Informatics? <laughs> Everybody knows who he is. Yeah, and now he founded the ISD program at Penn State. Sim similar era, similar era. You mean he's, you mean he's old as dirt? <laughs> uh, I didn't say that, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I don't know him. I'm, um, I'm profoundly uneducated. Okay, well, he's one of the founders of HCA and like community informatics. He did a big study in like yeah, Blacksburg community. Academic yeah, yeah. I'm a high right, school right. dropout. <laughs> That's true. Okay, anyways, anyways. I've so never spent a day <laughs> in class at a university. Oh, well then. <laughs> I, so, I, but I, I do know a few from their right, a few academics from their writing, and I know Nancy, so. She's, <laughs> she's uh, a. It's okay. All right, so, so yeah, third connection. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I'm interested in the course that you're, you taught at UC Berkeley, yeah. and if you've considered expanding it to other universities, because I think it's something that a lot of computer science or information science programs could benefit from. Yeah. Yeah, I consider that all the time. Yeah, but how, like, have you considered like how you would do it? Because I do think that like, I've actually talked to a friend about doing this. She's really interested in ethics. Yes, so, okay, so I will now, I will now open my kimono <laughs> <laughs> and reveal the truth. So, um, no, so what, this is purely aspirational, okay, is that, I'm, um, I'm basically retired now. So last year, Sue, my wife and I sold our company and we're, we're kind of just relaxing. We're just, we're chillaxing out there in West Petaluma. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, um, it's, it's been, it's been a great validation to offer the class at Berkeley, you know, at the engineering school and to get props from, from serious academics. This has been a real, a, a real boost for my ego. And it's also been, uh, been a goad to, to get more rigorous about, about what we're teaching. And it's been great for me to work with Renato, who's a, who's, who's, um, who brings a very different skill set but the same level of passion to it that I do. And we've worked really well together. And uh, um, we're gonna do the class again this fall semester. Mm -hmm. But what I really wanna do is create the Ancestry Thinking Institute, which, which is a really fancy name for what I'd like to do is I'd like to hold retreats at Monkey Ranch. Monkey Ranch is a delightfully contemplative remove. And what I would like to do is charge people a lot of money. Because <laughs> <coughs> I'm on a fixed income now. Um, to come to Monkey Ranch. You've seen the pictures. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and I would like to tackle these, exactly these problems. Number one, uh, I mean, I expect that, that, that the bread and butter that would support the place would be professional education. In, um, in ancestry thinking. But the other one would be academic retreats, which is how do you, how do you teach this at the university level? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would love to, to, to propagate and proselytize and, and get this word out. And also, I mean, there's so much that I don't know about this. And I'm reading more and more, and I'm finding there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great stuff coming out right now. The work that Kathy O'Neill's done is spectacular, and Sarah Wachter Botcher, and, and I just started reading um, David Graeber's book, Bullshit Jobs, whoa, that's fabulous. <laughs> and guys like Professor Galloway, I would love to get some you know, people who, who think about this as a system 
and and to come and and it, look. It's as technologists, we tend to want to find the the technology that works. You know, the key that unlocks the. You know, we're looking for the magic bullet. You know, and and. And there is no magic bullet. You know, Brooks said that there is no magic. There's no silver bullet, and and so and so, what what I'm really asking is what ancestry thinking really is: is slow down and think things through. That's really all it is, because we're we're plunging headlong into a dystopic future. And we're, we're, you know, we're on board, you know, the missile <laughs> heading for its target, tweaking the, you know, the knobs and the dials. And we have to stop that. And, and the people who, who stand to make money, you know, by, by destruction, if you measure your success as a nation by your GDP, having Houston be 12 feet underwater is really good. Having Northern California burn down is really good. So let's stop measuring our well-being by looking at how much money changes hands. Let's just stop that shit. Okay? So, that's what I would love to do is, is, is get people kind of asking those questions together because that's all it really is. And a friend of mine said, he was a, a, he was a professional guru, and he'd go, I say, I tell everybody the same thing. I say, think happy thoughts. That's what he does, a guru. He says, but you can't just walk up to somebody and say, think happy thoughts because <laughs> they'll just laugh at you. you know? That's crazy. So instead, he gives them these complex metaphors. And people go, oh, yeah. And some people go, oh, I don't get it. So then he gives another complex metaphor. And, and some people in the audience go, oh, yeah. And other people go, what? So he gives another complex metaphor. And he says he'll just spend all day standing in front of a group of people throwing out these complex metaphors. And by the end of the day, all the lights are on. <laughs> you know? And, and he told me this. And then he told me the complex metaphor that worked for me. All of a sudden, the, the dials clicked, ding, 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 I got it. And, and the lights went on for me, too. And I get it. Is, is, that's what you have to do. It's a simple message. It's not a complicated message. It's not about design. It's not about technology. It's let's just not listen to the assholes who are sending us to our deaths down in the cliff. Let's instead do what's right for ourselves. That's all it is. But in order to get people to think about that, you have to over and over present different complex metaphors as all the lights slowly come on. You know, so that's what I want the Ancestry Thinking Institute, Institute to be, a place where we can all tell each other those metaphors and think up thousands of new ones and then go out and tell others, including undergrads. <laughs> Another question, yeah. Well, look at me. I'm okay. not the one who calls the names. Um, I'll go over here on the right, on your right. Um, something that I found really interesting about your talk was you're very specific about. Oh. <laughs> uh, good, good misdirection there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the slide specifically about uh, kind of taking a step back and looking at the context of the issues um, struck me especially strongly. Um, and then you go on to talk about you know, how the problem is this kind of primacy of money and the sort of divine right of capital, which to me speaks nice to- turn of phrase. <laughs> which to me speaks to this kind of super capitalist society that we've built up with all these mechanisms for ensuring those things like fiduciary responsibility of stakeholders, like uh, crushing student debt such that <coughs> students are graduating as indentured servants. Uh, it's nice that you can talk to, you know, money's not that important, but you gotta pay the rent and you gotta pay your bills because you can't even declare bankruptcy to get out of them anymore. Um, something that is interesting to me is in all this talking, it seems like one thing is the kind of water that we all swim in that goes without thinking is that capitalist, super capitalist society that we live in. And that's 
a tall order to overcome. So is that really what we're after? Is that you know, kind of changing that system? Is that where we're going with this? Yep, that's where we're going with this. Cool. Just yep. wanted, awesome. Just wanted it to be explicit. Yep. <laughs> bye bye, late stage capitalism. So I mean, look, <clears throat> look. Here's the thing: is that is that is that um, is that capitalism is a fine thing. Heroin is a fine thing. <laughs> Unrestrained heroin is not a fine thing. Okay? I mean, have you ever had surgery? And you've probably had a derivative of heroin. Are you strung out? No, it's a fine thing. That whole thing of drugs are addictive is just another myth, they tell you. It's, we do fine at controlling that stuff. It's, it's, these are choices that we make because they're stories that we tell. Okay, so we're told the story that we here in this company cannot do anything unless we can cost justify what we're doing. This is not carved in stone. This is not a true fact of nature. So one of the really interesting things that I've learned moving to the country, living in the center of agriculture, is watching my neighbors are these old school farmers. My neighbors on one side, they're, I live in a dairy farming valley. And, and, and 30 years ago, there were 14 dairies in the valley. Today, there's none, okay? And all these old guys, they still have cows walking around on their pastures, but they do it just so they can kind of keep their hand in and, and to act like they're ranchers because they're keeping the family tradition. They're training the kids and 4-H and future farmers of America and they, they like the role of being custodians of the land, but all of them have day jobs, okay? And, and the only money that's being made is being made by, by you know, cowschwitz down in Central California, drive down Highway 5, and you see this giant concentration camp for millions of cows. It, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's horrible, polluting, unsustainable, bad quality food, bad for the environment. Um, or what you have is the few people in you know, Marin and Sonoma County who've made the shift to organic, and, and they work really, really hard, and they you know, they've been able to jack their prices up because they're selling organic. But all the old farmers around me, they all go, I don't want to do that. I want to be able to farm like the way dad did. Well, you can't farm the way dad did. You know, what dad did was he shoveled all the cow shit into the creek. And you can't do that anymore, you know. And so instead, what you have to do is you all have to bring it all to the Central Valley and industrialize the scale at which you can shovel shit into the creek. And then that's legal. So, um, and then up in the middle, in between, you know, there's, there's the agribiz and the out of business old school guys. Then there's the new kids. There's like this Aaron Gilliam, who, who's the, the, the shepherd who lives at Monkey Ranch. And he is, he's young, he's college educated, and he grew up thinking about sustainability. And he has a, a very uh, highly refined palate, and he loves to eat good food. He loves to eat healthy food. He, he moved to Italy for two years to learn how to make charcuterie, or to be a salumiere, or is that a mafia lawyer? Yes. <laughs> and, um, and, and so what he's doing is he's, is he's running sheep on our property in such a way that he's, he's doing this biomimicry thing of, of, of running animals, a lot of animals in a very small physical space and moving them every day. So it builds up the soil. And this is this, this intensive rotational grazing. And he's been doing it on our property for six years now. And it's amazing to see the changes take place. Every season we see new changes. He's building the soil back up. And whereas conventional grazing, all conventional Western agriculture depletes the soil, turns it into a mining operation. But what's interesting is to, is to watch him try to make money at it. 
and he struggled, and he struggled, and he struggled. Now, Strauss Creamery makes organic. They moved organic. They are doing just fine. You know, in the agribiz down in Bakersfield, you know, where they've got 10,000 cows, and they make plenty of milk, and they're doing fine. But how do you make good quality food and make a living? And the, the conclusion that I'm forced to confront is there is no way to do that. You, to be sustainable and to make good quality food and to make money at it, you cannot do that. You know, pick any two. Okay, but then what you do is you say, well, wait a minute. How did we get here? Well, we got here by sustainably making good food. And money wasn't part of the equation. Why can't we go back to that or go ahead to that? You know, because. I, I don't, it's not, I mean, I watch these young farmers, you know, and we, I've, had, I've had many of them pass through Monkey Ranch over the last seven years, and, um, and none of them has a dime. And they work their asses off, and they have really good quality lives, and they're not angry, and they're beautiful. That's a good question. That's the thing. Why, yeah, why do they need the dime? But that's my point, is, is why do they? Well, the thing is, 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 is for, you know, what if they get sick? Shit like that. But, but the thing that's amazing about it is, is I've, I've lived my life in Silicon Valley. And I've seen people work incredibly hard. And I've seen them suffer. You know, they're, I mean, I, it's, it's not happy making to drive on 101. You know? And it's not happy making to have to go to those incredible meetings with that asshole from accounting. You know? <laughs> You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and, okay, two more questions. So I want to bottom line this. I don't, I don't want to smash capitalism. I don't. Because as, as Harari says, capitalism has been this great engine. It's a horse that we have ridden. But what we have done is we've let people tell us this story that that it will be better for us if we, if we relax the constraints on capitalism, which is a lot like saying our, our untamed pet tiger will be, it'll be better for us all if we undo these chains that hold him down. And it's not, and that's a lie, and it was done for their benefit and for our detriment. And so what we need to do is we need to get capitalism back under chains again. And because under chains, I think it's a fine thing. And it, let me put it this way. There's the free enterprise part of capitalism that I'm a big fan of. But the amassing wealth, I'm not a big fan of. But let me put it this way. I think it would be fine to amass wealth up to a point. But if, if any corporation or any individual has amassed wealth beyond, oh, pick a number, pick say, $100 million. Well, what the hell good is that to anybody else? What the hell good is it to the society, to anything, to anybody? I mean, I would pass a constitutional amendment tomorrow saying nobody can have more than $100 million, which means that you can have that big yacht, you can have the stable of Teslas, you can have your private race car. That's fine. You, know, you just can't buy the government, that kind of thing. So, yeah, 
let's eat the rich. <laughs> okay, question. Yeah, hi. By the way, not a word of this can leave this room. <laughs> the value of keeping it here? <laughs> um, Mountain View now has uh, the second biggest uh, open air market in the state. Um, so a lot of people are doing very well uh, selling uh, to, to people uh, on Sunday mornings. So it's, it's getting, th things are, some things are fine. Okay, there, 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 there are those people you're, you're, you're meeting. Maybe Petaluma doesn't, doesn't do as well as, uh, as, I don't know, Gilroy or something. But, um, you know, Terman um, intentionally made this valley. Uh, he went to Washington, D.C., and he says, we need an alternative to the Beltway. And so, you know, I have friends, uh, students, uh, and others that, that work at Palantir. I uh, get money from InQtel. I was upstairs last week, and the guy says, I wish I had the luxury to not, uh, to not take money from, from, you know, from making weapons. Um, and I told him, you do. Um, I, at the bottom of my resume, it <coughs> says, we'll not work on weapons. Um, it's been, uh, a, a, it causes lots of wounds all my life, um, and Thank sometimes you. interesting conversations. Um, but I, I, had a, I had a boss once that said that we really don't have enemies and friends in business. We have our interests. And I, I don't know if that helps others, but it helped me uh, because, you know, I worked at lots of conservative places. And um, I, I, I don't know, um, you know, how I, – I, I don't know if there's some Republicans in this room, if they can stay in the room. You know, how do we present our, 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 you know, our positions uh, in ways that uh, spread, as opposed to making everybody feel like a teenager that has to rebel against, you know, this PC concepts that we're espousing. Um, we, we, we socialize our norms, our norms. Our norms, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm not a, I'm not a behavioral psychologist, but, but I remember reading something somewhere once, but probably from Steven Pinker, where, where he said we 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 know that, that how does it go, um, we know that only fifty percent of your behavior comes from your genes, and we don't know where the other 50% comes from, but it's not from your parents. You know, it's, I like, I, you know what a Ouija board is? You know the Ouija board? It's, it's, this, it's this funny parlor game that's been around for 100 years where, where, you, where you put your hands on a little puck and it takes like three people and you put your fingertips on the puck and then the puck begins to mysteriously move. You ask it questions and it spells out answers and stuff. And nobody pushes the puck, and yet the puck moves. And that to me is culture. That's the zeitgeist, is that's how it happens. Is, you know, I mean, I, I love to, to, to see uh, junior high school or high schoolers or college kids walk around, they're dressed exactly the same. You know, I just love to see they have the same. Whatever kind of pants they're wearing, the, the, the three or four kids in a row walking together, all the same variant of the pant, or the same shirt, you know, or the same shoes, or the same skateboard. And, and you, you see it in, in grown-ups, too. So we socialize by looking at the person next to us and doing what they're doing. I went to a, uh, many years ago, I went to the 40th birthday party of a guy I went to high school with, and, and I ran into an old buddy of mine that we used to hang out together. And, and this, we were friends in high school, and then we got separated. And, and he always was, I just thought he was such a, a leader. And he challenged me to do amazing things. And we met on this common ground <laughs> after many years. And he started telling stories about me. He said, Al just challenged me to do all these amazing <laughs> things. I never would have done half that stuff if Alan hadn't have led the way. And I looked at him and I went, Roger, I thought you were leading. <laughs> and that's, that's how we do it. So, so when I say we have to talk about this stuff, that's, 
what we have to do. I mean, it, we really do have to, to drag this discussion out into the open. So I hear all the time young people saying to me, my boss says we have to do this because this is what makes money. Okay. All right. I don't want you to quit your job. I don't want you to get into a fight with your boss. I don't want you to, you know, to, to, to you know, destroy the dominant paradigm or eat the rich. But I want you to know that what your boss is saying is bullshit. You don't have to. It's like me coming out and saying, you can't sit in that seat. You have to sit in that seat. OK, well, I may have issues. You know, <laughs> It may be that there's an anvil about to fall on you. I don't know. But that you can't sit there, that's prima facie bullshit. And so when somebody comes along and says, we have to do this to make money, nowhere is it written in stone that you have to make money. What you have to do is you have to eat good food, and you have to be able to do it forever. That's what you have to do. Is money in Bible? Money's nice, you know? You know, the farmers who lived a sustainable, self-contained life don't drink coffee, right? Ooh, how are you going to get coffee in Northern California unless you have money to trade for coffee, which comes from, you know, equatorial regions? So if you want coffee, you need, you need money. Okay, but you don't need a lot of money. There aren't a lot of things you need to, to buy with that. Now, I'm kind of saying this metaphorically, okay, because there are a lot of things you need to buy, okay, to, to get along in today's world. But yeah, you need you got to buy the latest iMac. You need, is what you need. But no, but you need um, you don't need the money to. Um, and I, again, you know what was that number I said? Fifty million, a hundred million. A hundred million lets you lets you build the great big unnecessary house. You know. It lets you build, I mean, you can build at least one of Larry Ellison's yachts. <laughs> one of the little, littler yachts. <laughs> or one of his smaller airplanes. <laughs> um, but, um, but it's like, pick one, you know. I mean, you want to have the, the yachts and the planes and the, and, the, and the concubines and all that stuff. And the answer is no, sorry, you can't. We, we don't let, allow that in our room. Are we going to have one more question, or was that it? Oh, we got this one right here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. this better be a good one. Don't fuck this up. <laughs> <laughs> Can't promise you that. Um, but we, we have a fairly receptive audience of practitioners, academics here. Um, but you're a man of no small reputation in the Valley. So how has Anstrosy thinking uh, impacted, say, the Mark Andreessen's of the world and the Nancy Pelosi's, or if, if that's happened? Um, you know, I'm, uh, thank you, that's a good question. I'm, uh, it hasn't yet, and it may not. The number one reason for it is because I'm, I'm not going to go back into the trenches and fight for this. I don't, I no longer, I'm not the guy to do that. I spent 40 years as a firebrand. I spent, I spent 15 years as a firebrand for, for, for building my own products, inventing my own, uh, my own uh, uh, software products, and then I spent 25 years doing that for interaction design. And I've, I've looked inside myself and said, you know, do you have the stamina, do you have the passion and the interest to go back in the trenches and fight for ancestry thinking and to sell this to, um, to the world? 
and frankly, no, I don't. Right, well, this is where you're who doing Who said that? Well, thank you. I, I know this is a sim simulacrum of that. So what I'm doing is, is, is I, I've always lived in a world of ideas, and, and in the past I have fought hard for them. Now that I'm old and retired, I still live in a world of ideas, but fighting for them, I leave that to the younger generation. So Renato fights for him, but he doesn't have the, the, the clout. I'm hoping that people will hear this and say, well, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna fight for that. And, uh, and, and I don't know if anybody will. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, you know, I mean, I have a, enough of a reputation so people like Nancy ask me to come and speak at a, at a group like this, and, and you guys, thank you so much for listening to me. Um, but, but I'm gonna go home. You know, and I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and I'm going to go putter around in my shop and I'm going to be very happy because, because I'm just fine. I'm, I'm not going to... I, I think this needs to be fought for. And I think what this needs is, is, is somebody who is, who is younger and more energetic and who is, you know, not not, you know, maybe not somebody who's in their 20s who's all energy and no direction, but maybe somebody who's in their 40s who has both energy and direction, who says, I'm, this is the thing, I'm gonna go for this, you know? And, and then they will attract the 20 year olds to, their, to the battle. And, and I, can, I can, you know, come along in the background continuing to live in my world of ideas, because I like to think about all this stuff, and, and, and there's a lot more thinking that needs to be done. And, um, and that's the role that I want to play. I don't mind being in an eminence grease, and I don't mind being a, um, uh, a, a figurehead, but I'm, what, so here's what the Ancestry Thinking Institute needs, is it needs, you know, Larry Page to underwrite it. <laughs> okay, but I don't know Larry Page, you see. I'll bet if Larry Page knew about it, he'd be interested. Okay, well, somebody needs to, 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 to connect those dots. Larry, is that you back there? I need somebody to connect those dots, and it isn't gonna be me, because I'm not, uh, you know, I spent way too many years begging for money in Silicon Valley, and there's no goddamn way I'm gonna beg for another nickel in Silicon Valley. You know, <laughs> but thank you, thank you, because see, this is, this is what you do. This is, this is how you succeed in Silicon Valley. You create a vacuum and you invite people to step into it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.